You are in the um, panel discussion of following the crucified Christ on the path of leadership. And uh, we have three very distinguished guests with us that are going to be speaking to this particular subject. Let me first read a description of this particular panel. According to Ken Blanchard and John Maxwell, leadership is influence. Therefore, all of us are leaders. There has been no leader more influential than Jesus of Nazareth. This panel will discuss Jesus' example of servant leadership. And so I'd like to begin by welcoming our three um, panelists and just uh, sharing a little bit about uh, each one of them. Let me start with Kim Cargo, who is to my, to my left here. And Kim, first of all, help me make sure I'm saying your name right. Car. The G, the G can be silent. The G, the G can be silent. Yes. Okay, so it's Carbo. Yes. Kim Carbo. Awesome. Thank you. Very well. Well, Kim has lived nearly half of her life in a rural, a rural northern province of Sierra Leone, being raised there by missionary parents and serving as a missionary in various capacities during her adult life. From 1990 to 1993, Kim initiated an NGO called Community Health Evangelism, promoting health education and disease prevention strategies in the, rural, uh, the northern province of Sierra Leone. This program continues to today. From 1998 to 2002, Kim worked with World Hope International, developing and managing a rehabilitation program for amputees following the decade-long civil war. She had an additional four years of experience in the U.S. in public health program development and management. She has served as a health trainer consultant for the United States Peace Corps, and Kim is, was, was then compelled in ministry by the voice behind her and the faces before her who need to hear the gospel in a way that is meaningful to them. Kim, her husband Tim, and their three children currently live in northern Mississippi, uh, outside of uh, t in Tennessee. M I'm sorry, northern Mississippi, outside of Memphis, Tennessee, where she works in the headquarters office in Memphis and commutes to Sierra Leone throughout the year. Please welcome Kim Carbo. Thank you. Next, we have um, Doug Mazza, whom you uh, heard a, a lengthy introduction last night from Johnny, so I'm gonna give an abbreviated. Uh, Doug is the president and COO of Johnny and France. He oversees uh, this entire era of, era of tremendous growth since coming to the ministry in 1999. He has taken the vision of Johnny Erickson Tata and helped make Johnny and Friends the authoritative voice on Christian outreach to the world's more than one billion people with disabilities and their families, having ministered to severely disabled, having ministered to his severely disabled son, Ryan, Doug brings a personal perspective to every program at Johnny and Friends. He, is also, he also brings award-winning skills in corporate leadership as John and Friends has consistently received the Best Christian Workplace Award since 2006. So please welcome Doug Mazza. And then we have Billy Burnett, Reverend Billy Burnett. Billy is the CFO and Executive Vice President at John and Friends and our chaplain there in the ministry as well. Um, he contributes significantly to both the financial success and the workplace environment for our organization. Um, during his career, Billy uh, held significant engineering and man management positions through the aerospace industry. He has an uh, engineering background, and he made meaningful contributions to a number of military and commercial programs such as Skylab, B-1 Bomber, Ap Apache Helicopters, and others. Billy's passion for ministry and service has taken him many places around the globe. He has participated in mission trips to Mexico, the United Kingdom, Holy Land, both Israel and Egypt, and has conducted business activities in Belgium, Never Netherlands, Ghana, West Africa, where he oversaw the staffing of a center established to restore wheelchairs to meet the ongoing mobili mobility of families affected by disabilities. Uh, friends, please welcome Billy Burnett. And finally, I am your 
moderator, Steve Bundy. So, well, let's get into this. We're going to ask uh, the panelists questions, allow them to respond to these questions in various ways. We're asking that responses be, of course, uh, um, not abbreviated, uh, but about three to five minutes in these responses. Um, and then we'll go to the next question. Uh, before we get to the end, we will also open it up for questions from the audience. So be thinking about specific questions uh, with these uh, leaders that you have in front of you. So here comes the first question. Here comes the first question. Please give us your definition of biblical leadership. Your definition of biblical leadership. And who'd like to go first? Kim Wood. Kim Wood. <laughs> well, you can tell he's the uh, president. <laughs> yeah. um, well, I have pondered over this question for a while because it seems like there's probably a right answer, right? So um, it's either like Jesus or you got the wrong answer. But um, what I was really thinking is, um, in terms of biblical leadership, I think that normally when we think of biblical leadership, we think of how, how to lead. Um, and that's generally what we think about when we think of biblical leadership. How did Jesus lead? What kind of a leader was he? I kind of want to take it from a different angle. I kind of look at biblical leadership as being, obviously how is important, but more to the point of um, if you are in leadership and you're leading biblically, what are you leading people into? Um, when Jesus led his followers, he was leading people into hard stuff. And, um, and he called them to hard things. And so that's kind of, um, in, at least for myself, that's one of the things that I think I, I take very seriously is setting the example of what, are, what am I leading people into? Um, and am I willing to do that myself? That's number one, which kind of speaks to the whole idea of servant leadership. But am I willing to do that myself? But then also, um, what am I calling people to in that leadership process? Um, am I calling them to go deeper? Am I calling them to um, do harder things? Am I calling them to be sacrificial in the way that they serve others as well? Um, and so I think that's probably a bit of where I kind of took that is what are we leading people into? Yeah, very good. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. That's a very good answer. That's the last time you get to go first. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> I, I thought we could just say what she said. <laughs> I think I can agree with that, don't you, Billy? Okay, what's the next question? I think yeah. so. Yeah. Uh, leadership, I, I have learned over the years, I, I was in corporate leadership for many, many years, and uh, at what the world would call success, probably. And uh, I'm not terribly proud of that because it doesn't seem very important to me anymore after uh, serving the Lord now alongside Johnny Erickson Tata for 16 years. And I think. One of my definitions of leadership is what leadership is not. Uh, it's not being in charge. And the world will teach you that leadership is being in charge. And I think the biggest thing that I learned in leadership is that we gain power as leaders by surrendering control. And allowing others, being a servant leader, is magnifying the performance of others, bringing them to their full potential creating a culture in your organization or ministry or family that allows others to flourish and enjoying it. I think as parents, we can agree that there's nothing more joyful than seeing your children do well. And at that moment, uh, you don't feel any need to be magnified. And while I certainly don't look as, at, our employee, at our employees as children, they're full-grown, very smart adults, most of them smarter than me. Uh, and I don't know how that happened, but it, it had to happen. We have some very, very smart people at Johnny and Friends. But I feel very qualified to help create a culture in which they will thrive. And I think that when the leader is the only one in control, then the organization will never be better than that one person. And that's simply not enough. Jesus didn't lead that way. Jesus led by magnifying others. He knew when to use a parable and let people figure things out on their own. There were other times when he gave instructions, uh, this is exactly how I want you to do it. And we use lead like Jesus uh, at Johnny and Friends, not as a phrase, but as a course. Every single person that's hired at Johnny and Friends goes through this course so that they understand our culture. It's about magnifying each other. It's about magnifying the person alongside of you. 
It's about elevating the task that Jesus has given us to do. And modeling that, I think, is the best leadership quality I can try to bring, and it is a struggle. I've often said that if, if uh, well, th let me put it this way. There's every corporation, whether it's a ministry or a business, has this Christmas tree with the leader on the top and everybody else spread around somewhere. You, you know where you find yourself on that Christmas tree of organizational charts. And ours, Johnny Erickson Todd, is on the top and everyone else is someplace else. And when you get that, you want to look on it to see if your name's there, because if your name's not there, you don't need to be looking at it at all, quite frankly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, uh, and I realize that all corporations run that way. But I think God's organizational chart, this is important for a leader, is a horizontal line. I, I don't think God's at all impressed that I'm the president of anything. I think it was a task that he assigned as well as every other task that had to be done in this beautiful machine that he's created called Johnny and Friends. And I don't think one part is more important than the other. In fact, what he teaches is that the first will be last and the last will be first, and having a disabled son that means so much to me, I have learned how many applications there are to the last will be first and the first will be last. So those that corporations think are so very important, I have found are not very important at all to God. And I know that what his Christmas tree chart looks like at the top is really the ones who serve the most. And I know that on that chart, if I'm honest with myself, that I battle every day at Johnny and Friends to get to the center somewhere of that chart that my name is not on the top because I work with some unbelievable servants that just impress me every day with what it is that they do. And so I think uh, leadership, if I had to sum it up into one line, it is getting out of God's way. That's the way I would summarize it. Amen. Billy. Well, I can go home now, you know. <laughs> well, to be with the Lord. <laughs> yeah. Not to be with not the Lord, with I can go home. Okay. I, yeah. Yeah. Let's not get carried yeah. away with that heaven thing yeah. just yet. We haven't gotten through our audit yet. I need you for that. Yeah, we, that's yeah. right. We got, yeah. we got to make uh, Cape and Krause yes, happy. That's, that's right. Uh, Steve, thank you. Uh, as, I, as I thought about this question, one of the things uh, as, a, um, uh, as a student and as a, uh, a person who who has uh, uh, gone to school and who, 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 wants, who wants to learn and still wants to learn. I looked at it academically at first. I, I wanted to take the approach, what do leaders do? And then it struck me. It said a biblical explanation of leadership, definition of leadership, and it is not what leaders do. It's who leaders are. It's what God wants to do with you and, and what God wants you to become, not what you do. I was focusing on too much on, well, what did they do and, and how did they construct uh, their processes? And, 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 and so much of that was, of my thinking was about that. And, and, and then I began to ponder more about it. And then it struck me that biblical, a definition of a biblical leader is an imperfect person submitted to God's perfect purpose for their lives. Imperfect that? people submitted to God's perfect purpose. Because I looked at Moses, I looked at David. David was more imperfect than anybody. But look what he accomplished for God. I looked at, I'm often called Father Abraham. I'm everybody's dad. Uh, at Johnny and friends, I'm everybody's father. And I, and, and I looked at Abraham's life at his imperfection. But God said he would be the father of many. And so for me, I, I came to understand that leadership was about being a submitted man or woman to, to lead. And, and I made a quick note here that says that means that you are working within the context of how God made you and what he called you to do. And the parable of the talents, Jesus said he gives according to our ability. So let me just lead let me leave you with this as a thought. There are three key words about what I saw in looking at biblical leaders and looking at my own life because God wanted me to, to not do but to become. 
And the three words were purpose, call, and submission. God has a purpose. He calls you to it, and until you become submitted. And that submission is based on how God made you. And so if you can pay attention to how God made you, like, for instance, I, I, I'm amazed at, at how God gifted Doug Mazza and how what Johnny and Friends was 17 years ago and what it has become today. And I don't think it's because of what he's done. It's because of what he's become as a leader and how he ex explained how he modeled it. So if, if leadership is what you aspire to, even more than what you're doing now, pay attention, number one, to how God made you, how he crafted you. Doug and I often talk about the three C's of, of, of uh, leadership, and th those three C's are, are competence, capacity, and then God gave me another one, and it's called crafting. How are you made? And if you flow in how God made you, he'll call you to how he crafted you, and you will lead with the very best of them. You are still imperfect, but your name will be in God's book of leaders for a time yet to come. Steve, that's what I believe is, a, for me, has become my, my, my definition of a biblical leader. Well, I know I'm the moderator, but I'm also taking a lot of notes here. I don't know about you guys. These are great, great nuggets of gold. Let's move on to the second question, that is this. I'm going to ask each of you to give an example of how a leader models servant leadership. Give an example of how a leader will model servant leadership, and you can even use an example of your own life or someone who influenced you. And we don't have to go in that same order. We're not allowed to. You're not allowed to? <laughs> I can't go first, sir. Well, uh, well, well, we can go reverse. Uh, I wondered, as I looked at that, Steve, I, again, I paid attention to some of the things that, uh, that Jesus did. And I noticed that he released others to do ministry. There were two instances in the Bible that gave me a, a clear picture of how Jesus modeled ministry for or leadership for others. One was at the wedding of Cana. You remember the wedding when, when uh, uh, he turned the water into wine? You, you remember that? Uh, and it, it, it sort of struck me as I was reading that passage of Fresh and Anew, when Jesus changed the water to wine, it was still water when they were pouring it. It became wine after they tipped the big water vessel, after they tipped it and began to pour, it became wine then. It, so it tells me that any leader has got to be a person who, who, who knows that until I start to act, God doesn't, he won't show up until I start to act. And then I saw another great little picture of, of Jesus's leadership. He let the servants pour. He told them, pour the wine. He, he didn't need them to pour the wine, but, but he let them pour. I mean, after all, he's, he's changed water to wine. He, he, with his finger, he could have filled all the vessels, but he let them pour. And that's important for me to note that, that Christ models for us the release of ministry. Doug mentioned it a moment ago when he said that if, you, if, 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 if you're doing it all yourself, it's never going to become any more than you. And I've, I've, I think I've come to understand, Steve, that if you can do it, it's not a movement. A movement, you don't own a movement. And, and if you want a movement, whether it's in your church or your community, even in your home, you've got to release people to do it. And so Jesus let the servants pour. And then on another occasion, Jesus knew that his lieutenants were arguing among themselves about who was going to be the greatest of all when the kingdom came. And Jesus said to them, if you're going to be great, you, you're going to have to be servant of all. You've got to be humble. You, he taught humility. And then on that same occasion, he, he reminded them when they said, Jesus, today we saw some people casting out demons in your name. We saw people doing ministry, and we stopped them. And he said, don't ever do that again. He that is for us is, who, he that is not against us is for us. And so what I learned by that little vignette of a story was that Jesus taught us as leaders, 
release people to do ministry. Replicate yourselves. If you're not replicating yourselves, it must be out of fear for your role or it must be if some other unhealthy reason why as a leader you're not releasing people to do ministry. Release them to do ministry. Be a leader. As Doug mentioned earlier, lead like Jesus taught us to release people at Johnny and Friends to do the work of ministry, to find friends like you to help us come alongside people affected by disability. So Jesus modeled in those two instances, let them pour and leave them alone and let them minister. Release people to do the work. We don't own the kingdom. He does. That's what I'm learning, and that's all modeled in Jesus' life. Amen. I like that. We don't own the kingdom. We don't own the kingdom. He does. He does. Doug. Well, thank you for using every possible example in the Bible so that I've got nothing <laughs> to talk about. Yeah, to that, uh, he asked for, for one government. example, <laughs> and you had to give five examples. <laughs> <clears throat> I got on a roll. That's Kaiser, that is. Okay. Well, fortunately, I have read the Bible, so I'll come up with another one. Let's <laughs> see. <laughs> <laughs> of course, Jesus came for his stated purpose. His stated purpose was very simple. It wasn't to pronounce that he was the, he was the son of God. It was to pronounce that yeah. I came as a servant. Yeah. I came to serve. I was born to serve. I, I uh, became the leader I am because I am a servant, he said. Everything you see about me that you cannot figure out why I am different from everyone else, it's mm. because I'm a servant. Uh, and never before had a servant had the palm branches laid on the ground and been, been taken in on a donkey and been called uh, the king of the Jews. And, and it, it was all about a servant. It wasn't about anyone who ever led an army or yeah. uh, did, uh, led a corporation or led anything else. He led a group of servants. And so everything Jesus did modeled, modeled servanthood. And I think that's the, ser that's the model that we are called to as leaders is to be seen as a servant. There's the obvious uh, practical things to do that I find are very personally helpful. I, whether they're helpful to others or not, uh, I hope it is. But for example, when we go on a Wheels for the World trip in 16 years, I've never led a Wheels for the World trip. Oh. I go as a mechanic and I serve uh, a volunteer. Uh, I, I work for uh, a physical therapist and turn a wrench and some of you are very bossy, by the way. You know, they're out there. And they really like, yeah, you're one of them, as a matter of fact. Yeah, yeah they're very here. bossy. They love to have the president bossed around for five days, you know, and I, I go, yes, sir, yes, ma'am, and I run around. But you know what? It is the most glorious time because it really physically connects me with the purpose of Johnny and Friends to go and just get down in the dirt and, uh, and serve. You know, I, it, just this moment, God brought a, a memory uh, that I, I had forgotten. My first Wheels for the World trip was in Ghana, West Africa. And I had come out of industry, was not with Johnny and Friends very long, and we were in a truck, a Johnny and Friends truck. And in the back of this truck was a stack of wheelchairs in a big cage. Yeah. And we went out to this village. Often, if you know Wheels for the World, there is a center where people come to get a wheelchair, but not everyone can come. So we go out to the villages, and I like to do the home visits and meet the people individually. And we went out to where there, a village where there was a school. And if you've been to Ghana, the children all dress in a government uniform, kind of a peach-colored shirt, brown shorts, and government shoes, very coarse leather boot type of shoes that they wear to school. And as the truck came in, uh, the children chased the truck. Number one, there was no other trucks in this village, and uh, there weren't any other white people in this village. And so we were kind of a, an, interesting, an interesting thing. Uh, and as the truck came to a stop about, no, after about 150 yards of these children chasing the truck to where we were going, uh, we got out and uh, they, were, they were very excited. Something new was happening. They didn't know what all these chrome parts were in the back. But I looked back down the road and there was, there was a, a boy in, uh, with uh, crutches. And he was, had been left behind, of course. And he was a good 75 yards still away. And he was swinging as fast as he could and dragging his shoes. And I could see, even from 75 yards away, that his long shoelaces were dragging in the dirt and he was, had been unable to tie his shoes. And so instinctively, probably as a father, I began walking toward him. And I met him 
on this dirt road and got down without exchanging a word because we didn't speak the same language. I got down on my hands and knees and began tying his shoes. And I realized as I was down on my hands and knees, two things happened. One was I noticed that about six or seven children were standing there silently staring at me, trying to figure out what was this man doing? I don't think they had ever seen someone that looked like me on his hands and knees as a servant, which is the appropriate place to be. And as that thought struck me, it also struck me that, oh my goodness, this is what I do for a living now. This is what I was called to do. This is my purpose in life. And that was an incredible moment in which I realized I am called to disability ministry. And I think that I learned more in that moment than I probably have in any other secular seminar that I ever attended on leadership or how to be, how to be a leader. Uh, I don't know what that little boy was thinking as he looked down at me as I was tying his shoes. Evidently, no one else for the whole day had ever bothered to do that. Uh, and I don't know what the other six or seven boys were thinking as they stared at me uh, as I tied them. But I know what Jesus said to me. This is what I called you to do. Yes. Get down in the dirt. Yes and tie that little boy's shoes. And uh, I hope I meet him someday. Yes. I hope I meet him in heaven. All praise God. Amen, Doug, that's powerful. Leadership and calling go, go together, don't they? Yes. Mm -hmm. We're yeah. called yes. to be leaders, so we have to follow that calling yes, in order to carry out the journey and the path that he has given yes. us. Billy made a statement to me the other day. Billy often... Um, when you, when you interact with uh, our leadership, as Billy says, um, some people, you have a moment and some people leave a mark. Mm. And um, that young boy left a mark mm -hmm. on your life, Doug. He did. Um, Kim, what's your response to the question about um, modeling leadership, servant leadership? I think um, one of my favorite um, pictures of Christ and one of my favorite sort of concepts to really ponder and think about is that of the incarnation. And because I spend my life hopping back and forth between Africa and America um, and living in really two completely different settings and two completely different worlds um, all the time, really, because I'm really living in both all the time. Um, incarnation is really very personal to me, and so I have a lot of opportunity to ponder it from, from sort of a, a hands-on um, point of view. Mm -hmm. and, and it's been really um, powerful for me to um, just envision that whole idea of incarnation. And I think that there's something about incarnation that is in itself leadership, mm -hmm. that Christ just would give up um, all that he had, all that was his to own, the rights that he had, the comforts that he had. I don't even know, like, can you even wrap your head around comforts in heaven? Like, what does that look like, you know? Um, and then to come and live here. And then, you know, he, he picked, um, like, why? First century Israel. You know what I mean? Like, if you were going to pick a time to come to earth, wouldn't you, like, pick 21st century? You know, like, internet, air conditioning, cars. But no, he picks first century Israel under Roman rule, yeah. right? So under really despicable leaders and rulers, that's when he decides to come. And, um, and just show us who he was, and then to just be, really just to be. And um, this really kind of, I mean, this is sort of an ongoing thing that I um, wrestle with inside, but um, something that was very powerful recently, and um, I think somewhere in, in your uh, bio, I think we missed this, but anyway, I direct a ministry called Women of Hope, and uh, we work with women affected by disability in Sierra Leone, West Africa. So Sierra Leone is um, a very, very poor country um, and one of the poorest in the world. Um, and so we serve, so we're talking poor country, and then we serve women, right, who are disabled. Okay, so like that's as far about down as you can get in the world pretty, pretty much in terms of um, where people are on the social strata of the world. And, uh, and that's who we serve. And, um, this sort of really came alive. You know, uh, you may or may not know Sierra Leone in your mind. If it trips a trigger, it's probably because of Ebola, right? Um, if it was a decade ago, it would have been war. Uh, now it's Ebola. Sierra Leone is kind of one of those countries that just 
it just never stops. There's just always something bad happening in Sierra Leone, and currently it's Ebola. So um, in the midst of this Ebola crisis that we've been in for the last year or so, um, I was, we travel back and forth to Sierra Leone. So I live in Memphis and um, travel to Sierra Leone uh, frequently. We have a full-time staff on the ground, um, some of whom have disabilities and some do not. And um, it was, it was kind of time for another visit and things were pretty desperate. So it was a time when, um, first of all, nobody in the right mind was getting on a plane going to Sierra Leone. And first of all, no planes were actually going to Sierra Leone either. So getting to Sierra Leone in and of itself is challenging. But then who would want to go to a place where there's Ebola? And then when you get there and then you want to come back, well, America is worse about, you know, the whole Ebola thing was worse here than there almost. I mean, we weren't dying here, but man, people were scared. And, uh, and so you just say Sierra Leone and people flip out on you and then they won't come near you and they even like ban you from conferences and stuff. So really, I just want to recommend, I, I want to commend Johnny Friends because there's a Liberian here and a Sierra Leonean here and there in this conference. And I thank you for that because I have personally already been banned from things after coming back from Sierra Leone. We prayed so about you, but. I, I haven't just recently come back either, but I know that there are people here who recently got here from there. And so I just, I commend you guys for not following that fear. Anyway, so um, it was time to go back and it was really, things were getting desperate. And um, I decided, okay, I need to go. And people are like, why are you going to Sierra Leone now? Why don't you got your staff there and they're doing their thing and um, you know, you've implemented some strategies and you know what's going on and so just let it be, don't, don't go there. Uh, my family was among those people. And uh, so I knew, that, I knew that God was saying, you have to go to Sierra Leone. Why? Because of incarnation, because being with people, becoming like people in their suffering is very, very important. And so um, I went to Sierra Leone and something very powerful happened in that trip. The women that we work with um, didn't know that I was coming and they didn't know I was there, but we have a monthly meeting um, each month and I just showed up um, at the meeting. My staff, of course, knew I was there, but the women did not. And so I showed up to the meeting and as I walked into the room, um, their eyes just got huge. And um, they were, there's sort of this no touching policy going on in Sierra Leone right now because of Ebola. So nobody came near me, but everybody like, was like they were going to come and hug me, but they couldn't. So we just kind of did air hugs. And, um, and then um, after the meeting, I had done some, I talked to them and you know, brought them some encouragement. And, uh, but they asked me, why are you here? We've heard that all of the foreigners have run away, but you came here. Why did you do that? And I said, you know, five years ago when we started working with you, we said that the road to transformation for you, we know is gonna be a long road and a very rough road. And we said that we would walk with you on that for the long journey. Like not, we're not gonna be like other organizations that come in, do something, hand something out and leave. That we're gonna walk on this long road with you. And even if that means in the midst of another suffering that's added on top of what's already going on, then that's what that means. So that's why I'm here, because you need to know that we're with you. And, um, and the women were very moved. And at the end, now we've had a lot of, we have um, a lot of um, interesting situations in our, in our organization because we refuse to give away anything. Okay, we've kind of modified that with Ebola because the food crisis got so severe that we ended up having to do some food relief. But um, we just don't give away anything. And, um, and so the women thought when we came that we would be giving them free housing and free food and free money and all kinds of stuff. And, and some of them got a little disgruntled. Um, but that's sort of putting it mildly, um, a little disgruntled at the fact that we were not giving away free stuff to them, which they had become in, accustomed to receiving. And, um, and we said, you know, we think better th of you than that, so we're not gonna do it. And so some of them, you know, were like, well then forget that, I'm not sticking around for that. And, uh, but when they came to that meeting, at the end of the meeting, one of the women, as we were closing, said, I need to speak on behalf of all of us. And she stood up and she said, um, now we know that you love us. And I was thinking to myself, man, I've been like, I have been working hard for five years now, and now, now you, but I mean, really, I, I got what she was saying, but um, she said, now we know that you love us because you have come in to us when things are very, very bad. Mm -hmm. And she said, like a mother to children, sometimes there's nothing you can do to fix the problem, but you just come and you do whatever you can do and you be with your child. And she said, so we feel like that with you. And so as children, we have nothing to give you back except gratitude. Mm -hmm. And it was like the Holy Spirit said something to me and he said, um, tell them there's something that they can give you. And I was like, okay. 
And, um, and it struck me, my flight had just been canceled the day before, so I had no way to get home. And I said, you know, actually there is something that you can do for me. And they're like, what, what can we do for you? And I said, my flight has been canceled to go home, and while I love you guys, and I would love to stay with you for a long time, but my family needs me, and my office needs me, and so if you could pray for me, that the Lord would provide a flight for me to get home. And they said, well, we have to do that right now. And so they, as one, stood up, and if you've ever been to Africa, everybody prays at the same time, out loud. So, and there was multiple languages going on, so everyone stood, and they reached out their hands, and they began to pray for me, that the Lord would provide a flight for me. And I could only hear a few of the ones that were around me, but it was so moving. I was trying not to cry because I thought if I cry, they're going to think that I'm crying because I don't have a ride home, which is not really the case. Um, I was really just so moved um, by the love, but it really struck me that that's what really incarnation means, is just being with in really hard spaces, and that's what Christ did for us, and that's, um, I think, what we have to do, too, in leadership, is just to be with people. Amen. Amen. I have so many follow-up questions for every one of you, um, and yet... I don't want to take the audience, the time of the audience, because I know you're, you have questions uh, that you're coming up with as well. So let me ask this final question, and if we could keep our comments uh, to the point so we can save some uh, open uh, questions for the audience. But here's the third question uh, from, uh, from the moderator. What can we learn about the nature of Christ's leadership in light of his ministry to people with disabilities? So what can we learn about the nature of leader, Christ's leadership in light of his ministry to people with disabilities? I think you have to go first. Defer Doug, your turn to go first. I want to defer to Doug. On this. Defer to Doug. Coward. He was walk with it. I'll, I'll answer to you, Bill. I'll yeah, let you go first. Mine would be more first. academic yours as you lived it. Well, read the question again because I was listening to Billy. What can we learn about the nature of Christ's leadership in light of his ministry to people with disabilities? Well, again, I go back to the first being last and the last being first and who's been the most important in my life and mm -hmm. the people I've learned the most from. And it's, I, I, have, I have been blessed to have had a, a position in the world where I met some very self-important people. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, they were, they'd be happy to come Hard here and tell you how important they are. You know, many of them are at elected office, and I have met with cabinet members in Washington and, and, and others. And yet uh, my mentor, uh, the one that I have learned the most from, is uh, very much like Lon Solomon, is a young man that's never spoken a word. And God has taught me most, most through him. And I think that was his message. Jesus always went to the disabled first. I mean, they, had, they, were, they were chopping a hole in the roof of a house to get in front of him because they know where they could find him, and that was where the disabled were. And uh, that's, they must have been lined up for a very, very long time uh, in order for them to realize that, gee, our friend, we're here late and we can't get him, we can't get him before Jesus, and yet they refused to give up and chopped a hole in the roof of this man's house or someone's house and that was probably the last time he ever hosted Jesus, by the way. Uh, and, uh, and, he, uh, and they lowered him down, down through the roof. So uh, Jesus was constantly modeling dis disability as the ultimate servant leadership. I mean, what he wanted to demonstrate, you know, he's, if you claim my reason for coming is to serve, then he had to find the ultimate service. And the ultimate service that Jesus provided was to seek out the blind and the lame and the poor and to tell us to invite them in. And so I, I really find that disability ministry uh, is, and I don't mean to say that all other ministry is not important, but I don't think there's a higher calling than to serve the least of these and to seek them out. There are so many ministries to people all over the world that deserve Christ's attention that don't include people with disabilities. Yeah. And they, they get overlooked. They get, yeah. get walked right. by. And they were the first ones. People affected by disability were the first ones that Jesus would look for in town, often before he would go to the temple. Mm -hmm. And so I think that, that's what we can learn, that we, we have a high calling. Uh, we are in God's will, uh, that God not only loves people with disabilities, but you know that story about the hole in the roof? 
as the man was being lowered, who did he bless? He blessed those that were lowering him. And he looked up and he blessed them. And uh, I believe that he said, your sins are forgiven. I think he was looking through the roof at those that were lowering him at that time, uh, that their faith was so strong that if they brought their friend there, there was no doubt that destroying this roof was all they had to do. Just getting in front of Jesus was going to be enough, and it was done. And uh, I think that that, so I think that that would be the highest, highest calling uh, uh, of servitude. Amen. Amen. Uh, Billy Kim, would you like to respond to that or move to the audience? I have just real quick three things. I'll be quick, too. Um, three things, I think. Um, one is identification. Um, when I, my favorite story in the Bible since I started working in disability ministry is uh, when John the Baptist sent his messengers to go. He's in prison. He's, like, mm. despairing. And he says to Jesus, um, are, you, are you the one or should we keep looking? I mean, he knew. Like, he, this is, like, the guy that knows what's going on. He knows who Jesus is, and he's doubting, and he's um, questioning. Now, a great response would be, like, well, there's the walking on the water thing, and then there's that wa water to wine thing. That was good, too. Um, but he didn't say any of that. He said, go and tell John what you hear and see, the blind see, the deaf hear, the lame walk, the dead are raised, and the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the man who is not offended by me. Why? Because, and why would he, you know, it's always puzzled me, that word, why, the one, blessed the man that is not offended by me, because that's offensive. In a culture like that, like, to just go and hang out with blind and deaf and crippled and whatever is offensive. Like, people are like, and lepers are cleansed. Who hangs out with lepers, right? So he, that's his answer. Like, I am among the disabled. So take that back to John. And that's all he said. So identification is one. Responsibility is another one. You know, when Jesus, even most of the time when he healed people, um, the disabled even, he didn't just be like, all right, there you go. He's like, throw some mud on their eyes and said, go wash in the pool. Pick up your mat. Um, the guy at the pool of Bethesda, he's like, do you really want to be well? You've been laying here 38 years. Do you really want to be well? He's asking them to be responsible. And particularly in developing countries, I think this is a huge thing because people that have not been asked to be responsible don't know how to be responsible. And so to give them responsibility is, is dignity. And so to ask them to be responsible for, um, for their lives and then for their actions is, um, is dignity and it needs to be something that we emulate. And then the other one is customization. You know, he never healed the same person twice the same way. It was always different. And the issues of disability are so complex not one disability mirrors another, you know? They're all very complex, and so, um, and the person is complex. The person is an individual, so there's no one way that you can do disability ministry and have it work for everybody that has a disability. It's got to be customized um, to each individual, and so I think those are the three things out of Jesus' ministry to people with disabilities that I think we can take away for our own ministries. Well said, Kim, well said, Kim. Well, Steve, very quickly, I want to say, Either Kim is deeply spiritual or she stole my iPhone and took my <laughs> notes on what I was going to say about that because uh, it's right here. I said the same thing, and I, I did leave my iPhone unattended. So, uh, <laughs> Kim, you, you must be deeply spiritual, though. So, <laughs> And the other thing about her is uh, I noticed that she gave the perfect biblical example of unclean. You know, from the Bible, if you had, if you want, you had to yell out, unclean, unclean. And I'm thinking, here I am living my comfortable life in a guru, and there she is in, in Africa and around Ebola. How, how, how I, Doug, we can't compete with that. So we might as well go home. So, Kim, thank you very much. Thank you, really. <laughs> Praise God for you. But uh, what you said, Kim, actually, I, I, I do like to ingest a, a little bit of lightness. But indeed, Jesus had compassion, but he didn't look at people as being pitiful with right. them. Right. Disabled people don't want the people look at them and being pitiful, feeling pitiful for mm -hmm. them. They want help, but they don't want pity. Yeah. And Jesus remarkably would help, but he, compassion, but not pity. Mm -hmm. he, would, he would not only be the God who would heal, but he was the God who would help you and then he would call you to responsibility. That was the, that was the one word that I did have. He would call you to be responsible. I did so, steal your So praise iPhone, be to but, God. Yeah. <laughs> Steve, I'm, I'm done, thank you. Well, friends, we, um, we have about 15 minutes 
for to uh, respond to some questions from from you and we have a couple of runners in the audience with microphones if you have a question for one or all of the uh, panelists uh, up here please raise your hand and a microphone will come your way and please ask your question uh, uh, accordingly any questions from the audience that you want to give the uh, the panelists here don't be shy I was just curious about um, doing, you know, rather than giving, like you're saying, some of the people were disappointed that you weren't just giving things away, because I've had the same experience, um, that that does not go well for very long. But how, how did you manage that in your situation, ma'am, um, as far as what, what kind of, how do you get the people to be more responsible and in their lives? Well, one of the things that we did was we took a very strong stand right from the beginning, and we never gave away one thing, not even an article of used clothing. We never gave away anything. Anything that we did for the women um, or with the women had to be, there had to be some reciprocation for it. Um, and we, I mean, we took a lot of grief from that, for that on the front end, but eventually people began to, to realize that that was actually giving them a gift. And um, it took them a little while because they had been so um, accustomed to entitlement and, uh, and to being given things. And most of the programs that come into developing countries um, see disabled people as pitiful. And so they just need to do something for them. And uh, so when we said we weren't going to do that, I mean, to be quite frank with you, we were actually threatened with stoning twice. So, I mean, like Old Testament style. Um, I actually had my staff lock me in a room one day because things got quite violent because we just weren't going to give it away. So it wasn't always pretty. So I'm not saying like it works out great. Um, it sometimes doesn't work out great, but it has paid off in, in very, very big benefits. Um, so I would say I mean, the, the hardest thing is just take a stand and don't give in. Um, and eventually people see that, that you value them and that's why um, you're not doing that. Great question. I saw another hand over here. Yes, ma'am, right up here. Uh, well, we're talking here about Jesus servant leadership model and um, when we see leaders of special needs ministries are either disabled or with special needs or a parent and we have emphasized this so much because the personal experience is so important. Do you think that sometimes we're being judgmental of those that have a heart for special needs ministry, but don't necessarily have a personal experience. And Jesus wasn't. Mm -hmm. So I personally think that any Christian that wants to become like Jesus every day can do a great job as well. But do you think they can, even without a personal? Yeah. yeah. I think that is a wonderful, wonderful question. As uh, I'd like to try to answer that as the father of a disabled son, uh, because I have to admit, I, uh, my testimony is very much like Lon's. I'm not sure that I would be in disability ministry uh, if I did not have uh, such a profound experience in disability. Um, and when I became the father of a disabled son, I was sure in my mind that no one would understand or care about what I was going through I think I was primarily, I saw myself as the person everybody was glad they weren't. And then I got into disability ministry. And like people that are filling this room right here uh, and at this conference, I meet people all the time in disability ministry that have no disability in their families. And I am so impressed and so overjoyed by that. And it, is such a relief to know that I don't need to go find somebody else with a disability that can understand or have compassion for what I have been through. And it, that just encourages us it, as, a, as a parent. I'm not talking about as a leader. I'm talking about as a, as a parent, as someone who is, I'm sure, and I, I, I don't have a disability of my own that is a parent. I can tell you what my faults are, but I'll, that's another meeting. But, the, but as far as uh, a disability, I'm sure people with disabilities feel the same way, that when you meet somebody that has a genuine heart of love and caring for you, it is so refreshing, and they are such saints. And the fact that uh, there are so many of them uh, that are, are out there 
is just a true blessing to me and to my family. And to be at Johnny and Friends and meet these people all over the globe, that this isn't, this is a, a human condition. It is, it is not a national condition of any particular country. Uh, it is very heartwarming. So if you are here, uh, on, on behalf of uh, anyone who is affected by disability, and that's not only the person in a wheelchair, that's mom and dad and brother and sister, all affected. Uh, for those of you who have not experienced that, please stop apologizing to me that you don't have a disability. You are the hero. You are, you are the leaders. You are the ones that we can reach out to and say there is true hope out there in society that these good people are out there and can be drawn to the church and that the church can take its rightful place, not just with a room full of disabled people down the hall at Sunday school, but in the sanctuary of the church that we can all celebrate each other as being born in, uh, in, the, in the image of God. So thank you for saying I that. agree with that. And I think integration works two ways too. So we have to keep that in mind. You know, if disability ministries are only full of disabled people, where's the integration in that? Yes. Um, so it has to work both ways. The uh, through the roof example is a prime example yeah. <laughs> of the two brothers who brought a disabled brother with them uh, to Jesus uh, to be healed. So uh, that's a prime example that you don't ha you don't have to be as a qualification be disabled to want to give your life away and serve the disabled. So praise be to God, as uh, Doug has just spoken so eloquently about that. That's right. Amen. Yes, ma'am. Um. I think we agree that we can say that in the last 2,000 years, the verse in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 22, we should take care of the weakest first, is not really worked out properly. <laughs> Do you, can you say why that is, and especially what can we learn so that we do better in the next few years? That's a great, great question. We only have 10 minutes, Doug. Yeah, I, I know you I, might, I, yeah. you're ready to jump on that one, the, I know. This has, you, you have really struck a chord with why we have the global conference, and, there, and it's, you know, we're talking about church, community, and Christ, and we can answer under any one of those three categories. I, I will say very, very quickly, uh, and without, without being critical, but I think it's a mission of all of us that are working in disability ministry, and that's everyone in the room, uh, that in general, as I travel the world, uh, including the United States, the church uh, has given people with disabilities to the government to take care of. And th that, there's no instruction to send them to Rome, you know, in the Bible. <laughs> that, wasn't, that wasn't Jesus' instruction, put them on a wagon and send them to Rome. It, it was bring them in so that my house will be full. And so we have, uh, at Johnny and Friends, tried to attack this from, from, from two ways. One, it seems like most disability ministries, as this young lady pointed out, usually start from the bottom up. Some parent with a disability, someone uh, with, like Lon Solomon uh, comes in and starts a ministry. Somebody like Johnny Erickson Todd has had this incred incredible experience and builds a ministry in their church from the bottom up. I was, am I was amazed as a layman who came to disability ministry in an executive role. I wanted to know what are our pastors learning in seminary about disability. They're not learning anything about disability. It's, I have great compassion for my pastor. Nobody told him either. And so the CID, the Christian Institute on Disability, is offering the Beyond Suffering course, and we are with, hopefully with love and compassion convincing one university at a time that it is important to be graduating our nurses and doctors and pastors with an understanding of suffering and what Jesus had to say about it. Therefore, we will then begin from the top down at the same time all of us are working from the bottom up. The next generation, you are the research and development department after 2,000 years of disability ministry. You are very, very important to the kingdom of God. After 2,000 years, you're doing the research and development. Generations ahead of you will learn from our mutual experiences and this very conference. And, and hopefully, in my lifetime, my grandchildren will go to a church where a pastor has graduated with a course in Beyond Suffering and, and starts a church 
with special needs ministry the day that he opens the church. That's the future as we, as we see God's intention and what we are trying with your information fed back to us and a mutual understanding of how can we work together to get to that point and bring a biblical, a biblical concept of what the church should look like, where they go to the government and invite them back. I have to end with, there's very few, this man right here, Steve Bundy, was a pastor at a church in Pasadena that started from scratch a disability ministry as a pastor. He went to the government and said, give us your poor, your lame, and your blind. Bring them into our church. And you know what? There was no more separation of, of, uh, of church and state. They were happy to turn over the disabled back to the church for respite. And, and it brought people that never would have come to the church into this man's church. I listened to his presentation about 11 years ago for about 10 minutes. I wanted to see what he had to say. And I took one note, and it was hire this guy. You know, and, and that's why he's here today, and that's why you're sitting in, in, in this room. So uh, I praise God for you because you're a perfect example of what we are trying to uh, accomplish. You should be on the panel. Yeah. Thank you, Doug. Well, let's, friends, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close this out with one final question. I'm going to ask our panelists if they would make, make this. Oh, did we have a? We got two final questions. Four final oh questions. No, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. We're going we're gonna to go this lady yeah, here. I'm going to make it brief. I don't know how many know who John C. Maxwell is. He's a very, he t uh, teaches for leadership quality, and he's biblical. He tries to do biblical. How does that affect, because what you taught me more sense than how he teaches it, where you do it across the line instead of the top down. So anybody have any question can understand who I'm talking about, John C. Maxwell? He's a very well-known. Um, sure, correct. I, I think what you're asking is um, by saying flat leadership, does it take away the roles of authority? that he teaches of, but I think that's the question, Doug, she has for you. Yes, I, I, I believe in authority. I think God, God appoints people in authority. Uh, it's just that people in authority need to get over themselves. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> and that doesn't mean that they're not, that God doesn't, doesn't uh, somebody has to be in charge because somebody has to get blamed, you know, when that, when that, when it, it, do, it doesn't work. But, uh, but understanding that as a leader, I am on God's horizontal line, and I need, a, I need somebody in the mailroom, okay? I need somebody uh, in the field. I need a missionary, and I need a president. And it, it's all on the same line as far as God's concerned. Now, that, that job on that same line happens to be one of authority. That, that's, the, that's the assignment. So I, I do believe in, in authority. I just don't believe that it has any more importance to God than any other job that he has assigned. And in the world, authority means importance. In God's, in God's authority, authority has no more importance. It is a task assigned to somebody with that gift. Amen. Amen. Okay, so we do have our final, there was our one final question here, I believe. Yes, ma'am. And this will, this will have to be our final questions, friends. Yes, I'm gonna stand up so the interpreter can see me. Um, I'm gonna try to keep this brief. Um, I know, um, there's deaf people in the world and deaf people who are deaf and have disabilities, meaning they don't know how to read, um, and they're here in the United States. And some of them have hearing parents. About 20% learn how to sign, and they can communicate with their parents, but the rest um, are not really involved with the deaf community or not signing. So I've met several different deaf people and deaf people with disabilities, and I'm seeing the population grow but my question is, who do I talk to? Who do I talk to in the PhD world and the, the cemetery world to um, stop um, oppressing the efforts and to encourage us to research and be involved and try to make a change in this growing population? Um, how do I um, empower those people in the higher ups to help and not disregard this population? 
um, because there's nothing being invested in that community. Um, I'm just a deaf person, but there's deaf people out there who are deaf and have a disability. So what do you recommend? It's interesting that you use the phrase, I'm, there are people who are deaf and have a disability. Uh, we, it, it has been made perfectly clear to us in disability ministry that being deaf is not a disability. It is a different language. Uh, that, that is what has been explained to me uh, by many in the deaf, deaf community. So there are two issues. There, are, there is one, how do we best communicate with, with the deaf? And how do we then serve those with disabilities? Yes, I see you yelling at me, so you can, with your hands, so you can. <laughs> yeah, deaf people who have disabilities. Yes, that's, like that, that's two separate. Two, I'm, I'm acknowledging that you're, you're mentioning two different categories. Deaf people, you're, you are not identifying deaf people as disabled. You're, you're talking about deaf people who have a disability. Yes, that, that's, how I, that's how I understand my communication with the deaf community. And uh, I would reverse the question and ask you, who should we talk to? And you sound like a very good candidate to talk to. And I would, uh, I would be anxious to talk to you. Our service to, in our particular ministry, this place is filled with ministries that should be asked that same question. Uh, but I would be more than happy, uh, not happy, but not only happy, but anxious to hear from you as to how we can serve, uh, because we have stumbled there. We have, we have stumbled uh, over um, that question of, are you, treating, are you treating me as disabled because I'm deaf, or are you treating me because I have a disability? So we, we, we need to learn how to communicate with, with the deaf community uh, and to serve them better. And, I'm, we, and Johnny and Friends is probably not the only ministry that needs to do that better. I personally invite you to, to speak to me, and if there is anyone else, would, I wonder if you'd stand up for a moment. Would you say, if there's anyone else here, I mean, Johnny and Friends, we, this is not a Johnny and Friends conference. This is a global access conference. If any of you are serving uh, the deaf community or people with disabilities that, that are deaf, and have other ideas or other interests, this, this is the lady that we should, we should seek out. Can we have your name? Tanya Polstra. With an H or P? With the P. P, Polstra. Tanya Polstra. Oh, thank you. Okay, Tanya Polstra. I will be happy to meet with you, Tanya, and I hope that a half a dozen other people here seek you out as well. Thank you. I would love to meet with her also to discuss the needs of the deaf community. And I just want to say this a little off the side, but I know there won't be any deafness in heaven, but I hope we all get to worship in sign language at the same time as whatever we're going to speak. Because <laughs> it's amazing to worship in sign language. Amen. Amen. This is very exciting. This is what this conference is all about. The networking, the partnership, the collaboration. We're just thrilled and thrilled and thrilled. And so, um, friends, we have gone over our time a little bit, so I'm going to ask if you have other questions or comments for our panelists here, please don't hesitate to grab them, to spend time with them, to ask your questions, to visit amongst one another. We're going to have to break now because uh, I know everyone here wants to eat again, right? Uh, after uh, Friday night, you're going to feel like you've been on a cruise. You're going to eat so much food here. Uh, so we have a wonderful uh, meal prepared for you, and then I know at that time also during the, uh, during the meal time there are panel discussions, or excuse me, there are um, round table discussions you're able to go to, uh, country networking discussions you're able to go to, and uh, so uh, thank you so much for your time, thank you for your questions, your attention to the panelists here. God bless you, enjoy the rest of the conference.